When you break it down to its base parts, wrestling is nothing more than simple elemental storytelling. It's athletic theater, pantomime in a ring, a superhero tale come to life. And when it comes to which stories it can tell, well, there have been a few which have constantly worked over the decades. Take the good guy overcoming the odds, for example, something which has gone well for the likes of Brian Danielson, Mick Foley, or Rey Mysterio in the past. And if that doesn't work, you could always try faction warfare, something which led to the rise of great feuds like the NWO vs WCW, DX vs The Nation of Domination, or The Shield vs The Wyatt Family. That said, perhaps the easiest and most effective story of all to tell is The Win Streak, as whether it be a heel or a babyface, rookie or established performer, the simple act of racking up victories can turn any individual into a main event force quickly. So join us today then as we journey back to look at the best examples of this in Undefeated Wrestling's Greatest Streaks. And if we're starting anywhere, we may as well start with one of the most famous and fondly remembered streaks in all of wrestling history, and that's the one carried out by Bill Goldberg. Yes, if you were a fan of wrestling in the late 90s, then you had two choices. You could be a WWF guy or a WCW guy. And, well, if you were the former, you were probably spending Monday nights watching the likes of Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock battle it out on Raw, the latter group would instead be tuning into Nitro, where come September of 1997, after the NWO story had hit its peak, a new star would have risen. And this star, a former roster member for both the Los Angeles Rams and the Atlanta Falcons, would make a quick impact with fans upon his debut when, after obliterating Hugh Morris, he'd begin a win streak that would see him gradually rise up the card over the course of the next year, racking up further victories against names such as Steve Mongo McMichael, Brad Armstrong, and Perry Saturn. And by the time he beat the latter of these, his streak would have reached 74-0, with fans now taking note of every victory he picked up on the house show circuit and keeping track of it. So it only made sense then that, having gone through just about everyone on the WCW undercard, the rookie would challenge Raven for the United States title on April 20th, 1998's episode of Nitro, there defeating him to win his first piece of gold. After that, he'd continue to beat everyone put in his path, going through the likes of Conan and Kurt Henning in quick squash matches, all before then getting on the mic and asking the fans in attendance, who's next? And ultimately, all those fans knew that sooner or later, it was going to be then WCW world champion Hollywood Hulk Hogan that would be next, with this match eventually coming on July 6th of that year inside of a sold out Georgia Dome. But if anyone thought that the pressure was going to get Bill on that night, they were very wrong, as after hitting the Hulkster with a spear and a jackhammer, he pinned him to become the top guy in the company, as well as take his streak to 112-0. So vacating his United States title from there, the new champion would go on a string of successful world title defenses, with the most impressive of these probably being his match with Diamond Dallas Page at that October's Halloween Havoc. Then, with this undefeated streak now having reached 173-0, he'd face off against Kevin Nash at Starcade just two months later, there losing for the first time after Scott Hall got involved and zapped him with a taser towards the end of the bout. And this would prove to be one of the worst decisions WCW could have made at that time as, with interest in the product already dropping, beating Goldberg when fans still hadn't had enough of him only served to turn even more people off. In fact, Bobby Heenan would famously describe this moment as the point where the company killed its golden goose. Unsurprisingly then, WCW would be dead just three years later, and while Goldberg would eventually come to WWE and have a run there in 2003, it wouldn't be until 2016 that Vince McMahon figured out how to best use the former WCW champion when he brought him back and had him absolutely demolish Brock Lesnar in under 90 seconds. And while his streak was long gone by this point, over on NXT, another star was building up one of her own, and that was Asuka. But of course, this should come as no surprise, as upon her arrival in Vince McMahon's promotion in 2015, Asuka was already widely recognized as being one of the greatest female performers of all time, with her having built up a name for herself in Japan as Kana in the decade prior. So using this to their advantage then, Triple H and his team of writers in NXT would have the Empress of Tomorrow start a win streak immediately upon hitting the ring in the black and gold brand, with her first victory coming against Dana Brooke at October 7th's TakeOver Respect. After that, she'd continue to make short work of anyone else that was thrown in her path, beating names like Cameron and Emma, all on the way to eventually getting a shot at Bayley's NXT Women's title at April 1st, 2016's TakeOver Dallas. 
And on that night, despite having the power of the full sail crowd behind her, even Bailey would be unable to solve the puzzle of the Japanese star, as after just over 15 minutes, she'd pass out while locked in a submission, something which cemented Asuka as the queen of NXT going forward. But as it happened, her run on the developmental show almost ended there as, impressed with what he was seeing from her, Vince McMahon allegedly wanted to call her up at this point. Reasoning, however, that the brand could not afford to lose her, Triple H was able to talk the boss out of this as, instead, the new NXT Women's Champion would stay down in Florida for the time being, racking up successful title defenses against people such as Mickie James, Nikki Cross, and the Iconics. So dominating was she, in fact, that by February of 2017, she'd have become the longest reigning NXT Women's Champion of all time, with it at this point only seeming like a matter of time before she was called up to the main roster. But before that call would come, Asuka would pick up more wins over stars like Ember Moon and Ruby Riot, eventually reaching a full 510 days as champion. After that, though, her reign would come to an end, not because she was defeated, but because she'd been forced to vacate the belt as she was being moved up to Raw. And there, on the red brand, she'd continue to win, going through the likes of Alicia Fox and Alexa Bliss, all before winning the inaugural Women's Royal Rumble match in January of 2018. Following this, she'd face her toughest challenge yet when she squared off against Charlotte Flair at WrestleMania 34. And in the end, this would prove to be her undoing, as on that night, it would be the Queen who got the better of her, giving the Empress of Tomorrow her first defeat in WWE after 914 days. Yes, it certainly was an impressive record and one that will be hard to top, but if current AEW star Jade Cargill has anything to say about it, she'll be able to beat it before all is said and done. And of course, it's in AEW's best interests to push Jade to the moon as one of the biggest criticisms of the company since its inception in 2019 has been that, aside from Britt Baker, the women's division hasn't really met expectations. Thankfully then, with the recent rise of Thunder Rosa and the introduction of Ruby Soho and Tony Storm, it looks like this may finally be changing. But for as popular as these three are, none of them have the same level of star power as Jade Cargill, as despite only having her first official match in 2020, she's already come across like someone who's been doing it for years. And maybe that's because her first match saw her get thrown right into the main event spot as, on the November 11th episode of Dynamite that year, she'd team up with former basketball star Shaquille O'Neal to defeat the duo of Cody Rhodes and Red Velvet. And after scoring the winning pinfall that night, Jade would continue to rack up the victories from there, with her spending the next few months learning on the job as she made short work of names like Thunder Rosa. Then on the January 5th, 2021 episode of Dynamite, she'd reach the next level when, after pinning Ruby Soho, she'd become the inaugural TBS champion, a championship she's continued to hold up to this day following successful defenses against Anna Jay, Julia Hart, AQA, and Ty Conti. In fact, since her most recent defense over Marina Shafir on the April 22nd episode of Rampage, she's taken her undefeated streak to 30-0. And with the introduction of a new faction around herself in the form of the baddies, Red Velvet and Kira Hogan, it looks like she'll remain the champion for some time yet to come. Of course, if she really wants to enter the record books though, she'll still have a long way to go, because back in the days of the WWF, one man was able to go for a full eight years without losing his title, and that was the legendary Bruno Sammartino. That's right, before there was John Cena, before there was Steve Austin, before there was Hulk Hogan, Bruno was the face of the New York promotion, carrying it on his back as the hero of Italian Americans everywhere between 1963 and 1971. And during this period, after having first won the WWF world title from Nature Boy Buddy Rogers in April of the former year, he'd be able to go through absolutely everyone in his path, beating people such as Gorilla Monsoon, Pedro Morales, and George the Animal Steel. So dominating was he, in fact, that by the time it got to January of 1971, he'd successfully defended the belt a full 409 times, with this making it all the more shocking when, later that month at a Madison Square Garden show, he'd finally be pinned by Ivan Koloff in a moment so unexpected for the fans in attendance, many thought it had been a mistake. Luckily though, they would soon get to see him with the belt again as, after taking a hiatus for the next year, Bruno would return to WWF in 1972 to start his second reign with the world title upon beating Stan Stasiak, with him this time going on to hold it for the next three years. And while by comparison this second undefeated run was far shorter, it's still infinitely longer than anyone else's in the modern day. 
But that wasn't to say others didn't try to match it in the years that followed, with one of the most often forgotten of these being Tatanka. Yes, well, few may remember it now, when Tatanka first debuted with WWF in 1991, the Native American was treated like a big deal, with him spending his first couple of years on the roster going on something of a win streak. Well, we say win streak as, well, he hadn't lost by pinfall or submission on TV, picking up notable wins against the likes of Rick the Model Martel in the process. There was some massaging of the stats going on as he'd failed to win a number of house show encounters. That said, with this being the era where house shows weren't really followed that closely, TV audiences would be none the wiser. When as 1991 bled into 1992, Tatanka began challenging Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental title. This though would not end with him winning the belt, as with management wanting to protect the Heartbreak Kid too, the whole thing would lead to a number of double countout and DQ victories, each of which saw the heel keep his gold come the end. And as if that wasn't bad enough, seemingly having lost interest in the idea of Tatanka's undefeated streak, Vince McMahon would book him to lose it in the most unceremonious fashion possible from there when, on the October 30th, 1993 episode of Superstars, he'd get pinned clean in the middle of the ring by Ludwig Borga proving that not all streaks are great, and that even if someone keeps winning, it won't necessarily make them a main eventer. But of course, it's not just individual wrestlers who can go on undefeated streaks as, just a couple of years later, WCW would start their own run of victories when, for 83 weeks in a row, they dominate the Monday Night Wars. Here though, it wasn't pinfalls they were picking up, but ratings wins instead, as between June of 1996 and April of 1998, every Monday night, Eric Bischoff and his roster of stars would prove more popular with TV viewers than anything WWF was doing. And part of the reason for this was that, while Vince McMahon was still struggling to move away from the cartoon era of wrestlers with jobs, WCW were riding high with the groundbreaking NWO storyline that saw a new level of reality be brought to the show, as Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash staged a hostile invasion of the company. On top of that, there was also the intrigue of Sting, someone who had painted his face white and taken to sitting in the rafters with a baseball bat every week, all while there was simultaneously excellent cruiserweight action on display from the likes of Rey Mysterio, Chris Jericho, and Eddie Guerrero. Come the dawning of the Attitude Era following WrestleMania 14, however, the 83-week run of victories would finally come to an end when WWF picked up a win after teasing a Steve Austin vs. Vince McMahon match on the April 13, 1998 episode of Raw. And after that, it would be a gradual decline for Eric Bischoff's show, as with the NWO angle growing stale and stars like Austin and The Rock becoming mainstream names over on the other channel, WCW would end up going out of business just three years later, eventually being bought out by Vince McMahon himself in the greatest irony of all. But even if it didn't end well, they can still hold claim to being the only company to ever defeat main roster WWE for an extended period of time. And while this represents a high point in the history of wrestling streaks, it should be noted that not all streaks are winning ones. No, in fact, occasionally, some poor performer will have the unfortunate duty of going through the least desired of all storylines, the losing streak. And in recent years, perhaps no one had a more memorable losing streak than perennial jobber to the stars, Kurt Hawkins. But what some may find surprising about this one is that it almost never happened at all. In fact, Hawkins has since gone on to discuss in interviews that, early on in his legendary losing streak, one of the show's writers had pitched for him to beat Heath Slater on an episode of Main Event. Realizing there was potential in the idea of a record-breaking string of losses, however, he was able to get this finish changed, as from there, he would go on for a full three years between 2016 and 2019 without picking up a single win. And during this time, while he was eating pins for everyone and anyone on the roster, Kurt would start playing up to this part of his gimmick, with his merchandise even starting to show off the fact that, by June of 2018, he was 0-200. After that, the losses would continue to pile up, with fans now wondering when this legendary streak would come to an end. And as it happened, WWE were saving this for the biggest stage possible, as at WrestleMania 35 on April 7, 2019, Hawkins would team up with his real-life friend Zack Ryder to challenge the revival for the Raw Tag Team titles. And on that night, after 269 straight losses, the underdog was able to finally overcome when he pinned Scott Dawson to score the win, not only ending his streak, but making him a tag team champion too. 
Of course, Kurt Hawkins is not the only figure who's undergone a lengthy losing streak in WWE over the years though, as way back in the Attitude Era, while the big stars were racking up wins week after week, down on the lower card, a certain someone was doing jobs on the regular, and that was Gilbert. But there's a reason for this one, as being asked to play a parody of what Goldberg was doing over on the other channel, Dwayne Gill would flip the script on that figure's iconic win streak and instead undergo a series of losses, with the first of these coming upon his reintroduction to the company at the Survivor Series 1998 Deadly Games Tournament. And after being beaten by Mankind that night, Gill would have a brief run of good luck when he defeated Christian to win the light heavyweight title. Upon losing this a few weeks later though, it would be off to the races as, once he joined up with the Job Squad, a collection of undercard wrestlers made up of Al Snow, Too Cold Scorpio, and Bob Holly, Gilberg would rack up loss after loss after loss. And of course, while he was doing this, he would continue to mock Goldberg through his entrance and mannerisms, with him getting sparklers instead of fireworks at the rampway whenever he first came down to the ring, and even a new catchphrase for himself, who's first? But as with all good things, this streak would eventually have to come to an end too, and while he was originally planned to go 0 in 173 mirroring Goldberg's win streak, in the end, Dwayne Gill would score a win over Goldust on the February 8, 1999 episode of Raw. There, breaking his string of bad luck as after that, he'd go on a 15-month long run as light heavyweight champion when he retained the title in 2000. And that then brings us to the end of our list, because with all the great streaks covered, there really is nowhere else to go now. Well, you know, we suppose there is one more we could look at, perhaps the greatest streak in all of wrestling history, in fact. Yes, while others have gone on win streaks that have lasted for months and even years, no one has been able to go on the near quarter century series of victories that The Undertaker had at WrestleMania. It's become so synonymous with him by now that, if you only know one thing about the dead man, it's probably the fact that he went undefeated at the showcase of the Immortals for so long. But it wasn't always planned that way, of course, as during the first decade or so, it was pure coincidence that he never lost. That's right, while his early wins over the likes of Jimmy Superfly Snuka, Jake the Snake Roberts, and King Kong Bundy may have seemed inevitable, there were plenty of other opponents who could have easily gotten the better of him during this period. Take Diesel at WrestleMania 12, for example, with the rumors since being that Kevin Nash was actually booked to win this one originally, as he had a WWE title match with Shawn Michaels to build up to the following month. Of course, when he handed in his notice to leave WWF, however, that, if you believe what you read, led to a last-minute change of plans, saving the streak before it could even become a thing. And it's not just there it could have ended either. At WrestleMania 14, for example, it wouldn't have been a stretch to imagine Kane getting the big win in round one of their feud, establishing him as even more of a monster heel. On top of that, at WrestleMania 9, Giant Gonzalez near enough beat The Undertaker when he knocked him out with a chloroform-soaked rag. Just a little tweak to this finish then, especially since they were going to return to it at that year's SummerSlam, and things could have easily ended early. Luckily, none of this happened though, and instead, by WrestleMania 21 in 2005, the streak was formally being marketed as a thing. After that, every year, the Phenom would face a new challenger, usually in the form of some young up-and-comer, as at various points, Randy Orton, Edge, and Batista all staked their claims to being the one to beat him. In the end, though, none of them could, and neither could Shawn Michaels and Triple H as it happened, even despite getting two opportunities each in a four-year-long mini-arc between 2009 and 2012, which led to some of the greatest wrestling matches of all time. In fact, the first match of these four, The Undertaker's showdown with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25, is still considered by many to this day to be the single greatest wrestling match of all time. So with high expectations to meet going forward then, the streak would continue to give us show stealers in the years that followed as CM Punk became the latest man to challenge the dead man at WrestleMania 29. And as it happened, he would be the last person to fall during this career-defining run as, the year after that, at WrestleMania 30, Brock Lesnar would shock the world when he pinned The Undertaker clean in the middle of the ring in a moment that has since been described as WWE's Red Wedding. An event so unexpected, it left the 75,000 or so people in attendance in stunned silence. But it's fitting that it would get this reaction when it ended because, as we've said before, The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak will probably go down in history as the greatest streak of all time. Not that the others on this list are any slouch though, as between them, they each prove that if you really want to get people invested in something in wrestling, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
All you have to do is have someone win or lose until people start caring. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.